from the maelstrom of a sundered world, the eight realms were born. The formless and the divine exploded into life. Strange new worlds appeared in the firmament, each one gilded with spirits, gods, and men. Noblest of the gods was Sigmar. For years beyond reckoning, he illuminated the realms, wreathed in light and majesty as he carved out his reign. His strength was the power of thunder. His wisdom was infinite. Mortal and immortal alike kneeled before his lofty throne. Great empires rose, and, for a while, treachery was banished. Sigmar claimed the land and sky as his own, and ruled over a glorious age of myth. But cruelty is tenacious. As had been foreseen, the great alliance of gods and men tore itself apart. Myth and legend crumbled into chaos. Darkness flooded the realms. Torture, slavery, and fear replaced the glory that came before. Sigmar turned his back on the mortal kingdoms, disgusted by their fate. He fixed his gaze instead on the remains of the world he had lost long ago, brooding over its charred core, searching endlessly for a sign of hope. And then, in the dark heat of his rage, he caught a glimpse of something magnificent. He pictured a weapon born of the heavens, a beacon powerful enough to pierce the endless night, an army hewn from everything he had lost. Sigmar set his artisans to work, and for long ages they toiled, striving to harness the power of the stars. As Sigmar's great work neared completion, he turned back to the realms and saw that the dominion of chaos was almost complete. The hour for vengeance had come. Finally, with lightning blazing across his brow, he stepped forth to unleash his creation. The age of Sigmar had begun. Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about what, in my opinion, is one of the more creatively designed Age of Sigmar factions. Ideneth Deepkin. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that the opening of this book was redundant from, I think, even just the last one that I read. Uh, they generally seem to have been different, but maybe this was released at the same time as another one, and so they just copied and pasted. I'm not sure. Anyways, let's get started. Ideneth Deepkin. From out of blackness they came, emerging from the depths of the realm's seas upon a surging tide of magic. These merciless raiders do not seek merely to slaughter or enslave, however, for they are the Ideneth Deepkin. They have come to take their victims' very souls. So that answers the question I've been asking for a while, is what is the analog for these guys in fantasy and its dark elves, I guess. <laughs> the oceans of the mortal realms do not easily divulge even the least of their secrets. In those unplumbed depths lie wonders untold, sunken treasures and a diversity of creatures beyond count. Occasionally, some hint of these watery marvels is wrested from the gloom, brought up from the crushing depths upon a fisherman's line, or carried to shore by wayward tides. The greatest of the sea's secrets use layered veils of powerful magic to ensure that none who bear witness to them live to tell the tale. The Ideneth Deepkin are a mysterious race of elves that dwell in absolute secrecy in the most profound reaches of the depths. When they emerge upon the surface world, they do so for one purpose, and one purpose only. War. They are raiders, constantly sending forth their armies, known as phalanxes, in waves. Their attacks 
attacks are swift, yet there are warning signs for those perceptive enough to pick up on them. Even hundreds of miles from water, a salt tang hangs heavy in the air, an eerie keening and the sound of crashing waves can be heard in the roar of the wind, and a chill mist rises. Sailors and coast dwellers have learned to recognize and fear such portents. These invaders seek neither plunder nor land, but rather they hunt mortal souls. The Ideneth Deep can arrive in a mystic haze, a swell of fear rolling before them. Even when they fight upon dry land, the Ideneth Deep can bring with them the magic of their kingdoms, an ether sea of roiling currents and crushing pressures. Many a stunned landsman has gasped in disbelief to see legendary behemoths of the deep swimming through the air, fighting under the command of cold-eyed elf warriors. With the speed of a flood died, the Idaneth attack, massed Namarti infantry advancing to the fore with eel-mounted cavalry darting in upon the flanks. Sinister, finned shapes skim menacingly from the murk, elf riders upon their backs pouring out a fusillade of harpoon fire. Excuse me, I think it's fusillade. Pounding drums radiate distorting magic as hulking leviathans glide through the air, missiles glancing off their thick armored shells. At the zenith of the battle, the Ideneth surge, unstoppable in their fury. As the tide recedes, so too does the Ideneth battle line. Yet they continue to rain arrows and launch counterattacks even as they withdraw. In their passing, the Ideneth leave ruin, death, and sleepers that will never awaken. Victims whose souls have been stolen. Retreating beneath the waves, the Ideneth return to the utter isolation of the depths. I shall tell thee, boy, of what happened to the town of Westmoor. What you know now is just the old ruins. "'Twas an odd day, for that morn we awoke to the smell of the sea, "'passing strange, for the salt winds had never carried so far. "'At sunset the fog rose, thickening while we slept, "'rolling across the village like a damp shroud. "'The air itself grew heavy, so thick that the torches of the night watch fizzled out, "'and a man had to gasp to draw breath. "'From out of those mists they came, Writhing dragons and hulking behemoths from the old tales, their great fangs flashing in the murk. They came floating over the land, swarming over the town walls. I have never seen anything like it. The watchmen, the militia, all slain. Cruel phantoms danced among them too, the beasts answering to their commands. In the morning the mists were gone, and so were all of Westmore's folk, except for those that slept unwaking. It is no myth. I was there. I alone escaped to tell thee. I... Pardon me, lad, but it feels like the six smiths themselves are hammering my skull. First... There is a blackness, a fathomless nothing. Yet something stirs in the void, ripples sent forth from what lies beyond. Victims do not believe what they are seeing, their heartbeats quickening even as their movements slow. Disoriented, they feel as though they are underwater, their vision refracting as if they peer through shifting currents. Unsure if their eyes are playing tricks, menacing shapes seem to take form just beyond the edge of their sight. And then, sliding from out of utter darkness, comes the stuff of nightmares. 
man-eating sea monsters out of old fishermen's tales. Rising out of tempestuous waters, the Ideneth Deepkin rush in like the tide, bringing their eldritch seas along with them. They terrorize those who dwell along the shorelines, but nowhere, no matter how far inland, is safe from their raids. Striking swiftly, the Ideneth collect their tally of souls before retreating as suddenly as they arrived. In their wake, they leave the dead and the doomed, sleepers whose souls have been stolen, fated to soon wither and join their slain kin. The magic of the Ideneth ensures that any survivors remember little, their memories smothered by a lingering fear of the mysteries that lie hidden within the sea's depths. A Strange Genesis They were born out of agony and unimaginable suffering delivered from an eternity of torment and temptation. This horrific beginning has twisted and shaped every aspect of how the elves, known as the Ideneth Deepkin, have developed. Theirs is a long history of shadow and pain. The tale of how the Ideneth Deepkin came to be begins before the Age of Myth. It is a time that only the immortal gods recall. An era when the forces of chaos battled for dominion of the world that was. So great were the destructive forces unleashed during that period that the planet began to break apart, and the dark gods reveled in their victory. Slanesh, the chaos god of excess, hungers for all mortal souls, but none more so than those of elf kind. With their long lifespans and heightened senses, elves produce the sweetest spirit stuff, a luscious delicacy that the Dark Prince will stop at nothing to consume. At the end of the world that was, Slanesh gorged himself nearly unto sedation in the grandest feast of all. Even the underworlds were plundered, and a banquet made of every elf that had ever been, until there were no more souls to ingest, or so it seemed. Those elves who worshipped Mathlan, lord of the deeps, remained out of sight, at least for a while, for their god was king of storm and sea, and the fathomless depths were part of his domain. There, hidden at the bottom of the darkest of oceans, he had long collected his due in secret. Yet as the world that was shattered, it was not, not long before even the watery underworlds of Mathlan were drained and laid bare. Slanesh scented more elf souls and rooted out each remote enclave. Those souls he worked hardest to find tasted best, and Slanesh devoured them all, destroying the sea god that sought to protect them. Thus, when the surviving deities awoke and explored the eight realms of Azir, Akshi, Gur, Girin, Sheish, Hish, Kaimon, and Ulgu, they found no sign of elf kind or their gods of old. Desperately, the newborn elf gods, Teclis, Tyrion, and Malarian searched, but they found no trace of any kin. The three did encounter Sigmar, however, and they joined his growing pantheon. They helped to bring civilization to the primitive tribes of mankind that populated the realms. Some few elves were discovered, and they inhabited the newly built city of Azerheim in the Realm of Heavens. But this was but the barest fraction of a once prosperous and noble race. The elf gods continued their search, at last following a mysterious thread to discover where Slanesh attempted to 
recuperate from his unbridled gluttony. The tale of how Slanesh was lured and entrapped in the hidden gloaming, a twilight territory between Hish and Ulgu, is a venture replete with masterworks of arcana and dire peril. In the end, Slanesh was frozen like an insect in amber. The Dark Prince was tortured, and the process of drawing out that upon which he had glutted himself was begun. Under a pact agreed between them, Teclis, Tyrion, and Malarian would receive a share of any souls that were recovered to reshape and settle as they felt best. The first souls regurgitated into being were the last Slanesh had swallowed, those elves that had been hidden in the sea god Mathlan's sunken underworlds. It was Teclis who received these spirit essences, and he used them to remake elves in the image he most fondly recalled, noble and bright of spirit. In Hish, Teclis wrought for his new charges the luminescent city of Leiryu, the bright haven, or city of reflection. He taught the Scythi, the awakened of the elder days, of their dreaded foes, and of the elven pantheon of old. Although it was believed that the elf gods had been slain by their arch enemies, the ruinous powers, theirs had always been a cyclical tale, and it was Teclis's desire to revive the old gods, bringing them back with a new generation of worshippers. Yet something was amiss. The new elves were not adjusting well. They were withdrawn and grew resentful under Teclis's tutelage. The Sithai fought amongst themselves and split into factions. The god's inner eye could penetrate anything, given time, yet within each of the newly formed elves there remained shadows into which Teclis could not yet peer. Fearing contamination, Teclis wove purifying spells, seeking to root out the darkness. The new elves shied from this light of truth, and its glare sent some into madness. Fearful for their lives, the remaining elves fled. They scattered across the mortal realms, seeking sanctuary in the deep places beneath the waves. For the sea called to them. Teclis's caution bid him destroy his failed creations, for he felt in them repressed horror, a legacy of their nightmarish incarceration. It was his brother Tyrion's plea for leniency that stayed his hand, and thus he allowed them to escape. And so were the seeds of the Ideneth Deepkin planted. Over time, each of the Sithai's enclaves developed differently, but all were affected by their new environs and self-imposed isolation. The magic they learned from Teclis was adapted to allow them to live underwater, given at the, even at the most crushing of depths. They grew attuned to their new surroundings, learning to trust vibrations and changes in pressure more than sight or sound, and some of them became adept in the art of seeing the flaring soul stuff that animates the living. The deep places forced the elves to overcome new dangers, yet there was another dilemma that threatened to send them into early extinction. They soon discovered that desperate new measures were needed if they were to survive. The Great Emptiness No matter how far the Sithai fled, no matter how isolated their deep water refuges were, there was one threat from which they could never escape. The Awakened were doomed cursed by a choice between extinction and a grim blight, forever to be haunted by the ramifications wrought by their sinister past. Although they did not realize it, a curse hung heavy over the elves that fled from Teclis's tutelage. 
despite the rigors of arcane purification to which they had been subjected, the souls reclaimed out of Slanesh were each irrevocably marked. Some descended into what the elves called Malachi, a state of raging madness that ended in savage debauchery. Luckily, few suffered such degradations. There was, however, a more prevalent flaw that was discovered just as the undersea settlements became more established and newborn elves began to appear. Since learning of their origins and of Slanesh, the awakened held a lingering fear that they might suffer from contamination. Those fears were realized when almost none of their offspring lived beyond infancy. Like their parents, newborn elves were perfect in form, yet those who had learned to perceive spirit essence could see that the vast majority of their progeny were born with swiftly withering souls. The lives of those so afflicted would be cut short with cruel inevitability. Each of the enclaves realized their doom. With only one in a hundred of their children surviving, their race would be a short-lived one. The word the elves had begun to use to refer to themselves, Ideneth, meant extreme seclusion. However, like many of the words in the rich language taught to them by Teclis, the term could also have different meanings depending upon inflection. The root word of Ideneth could also mean desperate measures, an irony in the name that only later became apparent. The Ideneth sought an arcane cure to secure some kind of future for their race. Elfkind had always been blessed with long lifespans, but between losses to deep water monstrosities and those who succumbed to Malachi, the enclaves were rapidly dwindling in number, with precious few offspring surviving to replace the dead and the forsaken. No spell provided any type of cure until some groups of Ideneth learned how to remove a creature's animating life force from its body, and others discovered how to implant it within an afflicted shell. At first, the Ideneth attempted to transplant the spirit stuff of undersea beasts, but early trials met only with dismay as the energies flickered and went out within days. Realizing the souls of such creatures offered but a dim light compared to their own, the Ideneth sought quarry richer in spirit. That search brought them once more to the surface world. Souls stolen from mankind proved capable of sustaining Ideneth offspring, although it often took a half dozen such spirits to empower an elf to live even a third of their normal lifespan. Other souls, such as those of Dwarden, Sylvaneth, and Oryx, worked equally well for the Ideneth's purpose. The elves tirelessly experimented and perfected techniques that would aid them in finding, stealing, and safekeeping this vital resource. Even as new generations of Ideneth were born, the same ratio of healthy to cursed offspring remained, and so a constant supply of souls was required to maintain their populations. At first, these spirit essences were harvested simply to avoid their people's extinction. Soon, however, more were needed to fund expansion, and to continue the raids required to meet the growing demand. So did the Ideneth's attacks become the stuff of folklore and legend across the mortal realms. Those born with atrophied souls, but granted an extended life through a stolen spirit, are Namarti, a word meaning both blessed and damned. The Namarti are physically flawless, but far shorter lived than those born free of their race's curse. To make matters more difficult for their kind, many of their formative years must be spent undergoing long arcane rituals, 
and so they develop skills more slowly. Most burdensome of all, however, is the belief held by other Ideneth that the Namarti are tainted, a lesser class of being because they possess the stolen soul of some creature traditionally considered low-cultured and barbaric by elves. As a consequence, the Ideneth have a distinct caste system. Those few born with intact souls are the noble class, destined to become either Achaeans, the warrior caste, or Asheran, priests and users of magic. The majority are Namarti, who are treated as subservient thralls beneath the command of the nobles, and typically serve as soldiers and workers within the thriving underwater cities. That which is the soul. The soul is the animating life force of a living creature, the being's divine spark. It typically departs only in death, traveling out towards the underworld of the deceased's belief system, or drifting into the realm of chaos. The Ideneth Deepkin, however, have perfected the art of severing this spirit force from a creature's physical form entirely, drawing it out and collecting it. Once a soul is removed, the victim falls into a deep sleep, never to wake. Such spirit theft means that Ideneth raids typically leave settlements as empty ruins, inhabited only by the dead, and by those who soon will be. And that is where we are going to bring this video to a close. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. And I realize that these guys are more like Drukari than they are like Druki, which is kind of fun. Anyway, I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.